Human rights and the fifth estate. They checked on the computer and they stopped my father. They didn't let him get on the plane. And they, my father got detained at that day and they set me on the airplane and I came to United States by myself. I supposed to come with my father, but now just everything changed a lot. I was so sad because I saw, it's my first time to saw somebody else strangers pulling pulling my father and that i always very respect him and we almost never argued at home even so it's my first time to see someone so unres like treat my father unrespectful i was shocked and i was so sad i was angry and i was very worried because i don't know what will happen to him and uh, for 14 hours flight i was very nervous for 14 hours, I even couldn't sleep on the airplane for 14 hours. I woke up because of so many phone calls where my phone was ringing all the time, like for about 40 minutes and from different people. I got 13 phone calls from different people, from some journalists, from my family, and from my father's friend. and. I was shocked what is going on suddenly happened and when I picked one of the phone I didn't know who who it is who was it and said uh, the first question is could you please talk about what's your feeling now about how the government treat to your uh, like the trial to your father I was shocked because I just woke up and my brain wasn't very clear I said I asked what trial and then I checked the internet and I knew that the government finally charged my father. I tried to talk to my father's lawyer and he said this is shocking to him too because the government didn't accept the my uh, my father's lawyer's requirement to uh, exchange the documents and all, all of those requirements was legal and they just without without letting my father's lawyer know they just published this news that they charged my father as a separatist. My father is a professor in Minzu University in Beijing. My father is an expert in economics. He created a website, we call it Uyghur Online, and another name is Uyghur Biz. So that time a lot of people comment and post articles on it, and people talk about what happened in Xinjiang, what happened between Uyghur and Han Chinese people, and that that gather a lot of, captured a lot of attention from the government. Because of the publicity of my father's website getting popular and there are too much, a lot of people pay, paying attention on my father's blog and also through this blog people can know a lot of things about Xinjiang and that sometimes it's not what government want, wants. So I think that's why he fall in trouble now. He wanted to help, help Uyghur people, and he wanted to 
more people know what is happening in Uyghur society and he wants more people know how what is Uyghur people's like situation and first of all he created this uh, website is for helping the children because a um, few years ago I remember when I was in high school my father was helping the uh, the children who were kidnapped by the elder people and they become thief and they uh, they were hurted and like their body they're mistreated and they become they have to back on the street my father wanted to help them to find their family and he used this website to uh, like put advertisement to get like to spread news and let more people know about this and then can help some children he did help a lot of children find their families when my father and my brothers they were taking a nap at home and someone just crashed into the door and they were like over as my brother described they were over 20 to 40 i don't know the exact number that what he described was like this 20 to 40 police get in and and they just pulled my father in and they hit my father to the couch and my brothers was were crying and they were very very afraid and they took my father and because of my stepmom was in the work she was working and so they were afraid nobody care about this two child the children they will be alone at home so they called my stepmom and i think it's a neighbor called i'm not sure about its neighbor or police called my stepmom to come back home to uh, stay with two children and they took my father away <laughs> We have different cultural and we have different languages so and we also we have different face our face looks absolutely different as Han Chinese people so it's sometimes it happens like in on the street or in jobs we have the like we it happens sometimes that we treat it differently in every race there are good people and bad people and but sometimes good people also treat it like this way so mm -hmm. like when they face go to hotel they might not get the room and it it happened to us before like they will f have to first confirm and then from the uh, upper level higher level people if they allowed us to get in then they will allow us to get in to check into this the hotel First, because of we are Uyghur, our eyes look a little deeper. Sometimes we look like foreigners. And when me and my father, we went to a shopping mall. When they think that we are from foreign country, they treat us very nice and they talk to us very patient. But since they know that we are Uyghur, they suddenly just lost every patient and they just, okay, do whatever you want, buy whatever you want, just come to pay like their attitude will change very fast since they know that we're from Xinjiang and their attitude just change completely sometimes. First of all, uh, they will speak English to us and then since we spoke Chinese, they said how do you know Chinese? Because and we respond because we are Chinese, so of course we speak Chinese. And then they would say, "Oh, you're from Xinjiang," and you can tell they feel um they start being impatient. Like from their face, you can feel that, and they just they were in front of you, and then that time they will just go away or walk around and not being with you, helping with you for shopping anymore, like that. I think that base, uh, basically there are a lot of people who post it. Not only my father is not the only writer here. A lot of people they are free to post and co their comments. They are free to talk. And usually my father delete the very 
uh, extreme extreme comments and because some people different people have their different opinion but some people's like extreme comments might affect others opinion too so my father will sometimes delete their comments if they're it's too extreme and usually my father keep the moderate moderate one and and my father always accept the article from everywhere from every whatever you are Uyghur or Mongol or Han Chinese or other minority when the second year of my high school when I get home and because I only I'm I was only able to went back go back home on the weekend I, I live at school so uh, one in the, one of the Saturday when I went back to my home I found out nobody at my home and you can't feel that nobody there for a few days and it's weird that my parents and my brother didn't tell me didn't tell to, didn't tell me that they are going somewhere and they didn't left any leave any messages and I was very shocked and I was afraid so I stayed in front of my door in front of our house door for a few hours and I couldn't leave them back and I asked the neighbors they said they did, they don't know where where are they so and I found some clothes are gone so and I and I went to somewhere else to live for a few days and they just disappeared for a few days without any any messages for like for me so after like two weeks they finally came back and they called me said they've been traveling and their their sounds were different like not like oh we went to travel and there's uh oh, we were traveling and then and we left you a message but i didn't get any so after that i knew something something wrong is going on with my fa with my family now my grandma was a little sick so we we let her came to Beijing to like go to a hospital to go to doctor, and uh, when my father already arrived airport and took my grandma and my all my family was on the car, and when they were on their way back home, there was a car crash on my family's my father's car, and there was a police get up the car and my father also get, got up the car said point and my father point out pointed in the car in the window said all my families there are kids inside and the police said I'm that's what I'm supposed to do. I'm gonna kill entire family members that's what he said and it was when my father told me I was shocked and also this news was being published that time a lot of students love him and like people, the students likes to listen to his class. A lot of students from other school, like they took two hours buses to come to my father's class because my my father's class is like open to everyone. Everyone can listen his classes. So, so a lot of students can go to his class. Like sometimes even get a one hundred students in a classroom that everyone just sitting there to listen to what my how how my father my father's way to teach. He he very care about all he cares about all his students. So he always invites students to come to dinner in my house and. Uh, we always cook together for all the students so people always said that my our home is like a hotel or a restaurant for the students my my brother who is seven years old now because he was he saw he saw how my father was detained how they hit my father so he was like since and also he was under house arrested for half a year and he couldn't go to school very well and he couldn't play with any kids and he was being under very high pressure now he has heart problem and we sent him back to xinjiang to to relax and stay with his relatives then we we help we hope that he can feel better soon <laughs>
by creating this website, my father's website, he was trying to let more people know about the culture and he wanted to also advocate that people should treat whatever who, whoever you are, that you should be treated same equally, whatever you are, Han Chinese or Uyghur or other minority ethnicity people. So he wanted to he wanted Uyghur people can get same job opportunity and same of course the attitude should be like same when people meet each other like people can be communicate very well that's what my father wanted last month finally the government allowed my father's lawyer to visit him for one time and they could meet that's how we knew that they denied my father to uh, denied my father to eat for 10 days. My father's lawyer told us that he looked very weak and he has been he lost too much weight so he's very skinny now but um, also he told us that his eyes is still very shining. He was honored from uh, honored to freedom to write from Penn and I, I really appreciate what they did for my father and it really helped a lot. It captured more people's attention. And I think it's really good for my father's case. And in my father's case, we need more people's attention. Then people won't forget. And the government know that outside of the China, people are paying attention. And they would, they would treat my father's case carefully and fairly. Four months ago, I went to the State Department. I, I testified for my father, and it captured a little attention for my father. And after that, I, in the same day of the gala, my, my op-ed in New York Times had been published. I was really worried. Are all the things that I've done is really helpful for my father? Or it might be, have negative impact for my father, like effect for my father. I was really worried. It's like gambling. We have to, we have to try. Cause I can't just sit there and wait news. I have been waiting for three months from Feb, uh, from January to March and they didn't give me, the government didn't give me what I want. So I had to stand up to speak for my father because I can't just stand there to wait because he's my father. I want my father get released soon. So I have to try whatever I can do. You think it might work, but you're it not might. sure. I'm not sure because we don't know how the the government think we don't know how they will do for the next step i'm just trying all the way that can help him i've been barred from going to china i flew into beijing with a valid visa passport and I was put into detention at the airport and sent back on the first plane. Uh, clearly I am on a blacklist. All that I have done is speak out for Ilham. I've been uh, uh, very vocal, you know, you know, perhaps very much so, but nevertheless the only thing that I've used I I on Ilham's behalf are words. And I have no intention of uh, shutting up and I think uh, uh, I phrased it this way, I said, uh, I have no intention of conforming to authoritarian norms in order to get a visa. And, you know, there's nothing more that I can say about that. One thing which has to be pointed out is that, you know, he very uh, 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 purposefully created this blog, which is in Chinese, in order that Chinese people could read about what was going on in Xinjiang and how Uyghur people felt. And it was really meant to be a, a forum between Uyghurs and Chinese as much as anything else. Um, he was interested in dialogue. And his website was uh, centered around that. But of course the most important thing is to bring uh, before a Chinese readership the feelings of Uyghurs. Uh, because the vast majority of people in the People's Republic of China, the Chinese majority, knows how they feel or they know what the party line is, I should say, but what they're not exposed to is uh, the feelings and the sentiments and the perspective of Uyghurs. And so he wanted to create a space in which it was possible for Chinese readers uh, to have access to this. 
Chinese readers, some of them indeed uh, were responsive. But you know, it's a funny thing when you have uh, um, websites like this, and when you have people posting like this. Sometimes you'll get very nasty rejoinders, and it is a part of the uh, Chinese method of dealing with online dissidents to use people to post negative and nasty things. Uh, some people call them the uh, 50 cent army or whatever. The idea being that they get half of, a, half of a yuan for each post they put up. And this is well known. I think they should release him. Do you, what do you think they should do? Well, you know, it's never too late to do the right thing. I mean, no matter how bad the uh, situation is, uh, one has to advocate that they do the right thing. Um, he's been arrested on trumped-up charges. I think he should be released, of course. Um, uh, as I said, I don't think it's possible for him to get a fair trial, and I certainly don't think the Chinese government would uh, 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 allow uh, objective and impartial observers to go over the evidence and uh, uh, to review uh, the trial. Um, it's been noted, not by me, but by others, that um, Ilham Tokti is one of the few Uyghur intellectuals who's not seriously contemplating separatism and uh, independence by arresting the one person who actually is trying to uh, 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 maintain a dialogue with free thinking Chinese intellectuals and others inside the People's Republic of China. Um, they've uh, basically added fuel to the fire of those who really don't see any uh, uh, future in Xinjiang's being a part of the People's Republic of China, any Uyghur future in this. When it comes to China now, there is an increasing silence. And this is not, it's, you know, don't get me wrong, it's not just Hollywood. This, this carries over into many aspects of life, including corporations, universities. Uh, there are many institutions and many entities which uh, really do want a place within the Chinese economy. And we wind up with uh, uh, these palliatives that some people will say, oh, no, 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 don't protest, don't protest publicly. Um, uh, we need quiet diplomacy, which is, you know, the same argument that was made during the heyday of apartheid. The Chinese government, in general, is quite intolerant of free speech, particularly free speech that is critical of their policies or of the party in any way. So Ilhan Toti is unfortunately one of a number of Chinese writers and scholars who have been persecuted or imprisoned for, the, for their words, essentially, for their writing, for what they speak about. Um, in Ilhan Toti's case, he's essentially in prison for trying to have a conversation. Ilhan Toti himself, last July, July 2013, published a statement through Radio Free Asia, which our president, Peter Godwin, has described as a chronicle of an arrest foretold, in which he essentially laid out his fears that he was about to be arrested for good, and then did a catalog, which is just absolutely chilling now that we know what has happened to him, where he described that there were no marks on his body. He described words that he would never say. He said, I would never commit suicide, that's against my beliefs. This is a person who is laying out his will in a way to try to tell you if they tell you that I did this to myself, don't believe them. And because he's raised questions about the Chinese government's policies in Xinjiang, which is where most of the Uyghur minority lives, he's been put in jail and charged with a very serious crime. He is formally being indicted for the charge of separatism, which is an extremely serious charge in China. He carries a prison term of up to the death penalty, or life imprisonment, or a term of years. We don't know what it will be yet. Um, but the formal indictment is particularly significant in China because this tends to mark the stage at which there is no return. Uh, it's extremely rare to be acquitted after you have been formally indicted. So at this point, the expectation is there will be something of a show trial, and then there will be a conviction and a sentencing. He's a really remarkable person with a really remarkable family. His young daughter, Jauhar, who is only 18 and 19 years old, is currently living essentially on her own in the United States at Indiana University, where she's studying English. 
Um, and this incredibly brave young woman has taken it upon herself to fight for her father's freedom at an age most of us wouldn't even think about standing for any political issue. If you go to our website, you'll find several different ways you can help in Ilham's case. We have a petition that you can sign. Um, there's an open letter that we put out from a number of prominent writers to the Chinese government calling for his release. There's also ways that you can help by putting out word about his case through social media, through your own Twitter account or your Facebook account, telling people what you know about the case. Um, there's a number of things you can do, really. Dialogue is so important, particularly to Penn, because we think that it is the way to resolve conflict and to avoid conflict. Penn was founded in between the two great world wars. After World War I and right before World War II, you began to see the emergence of centers of writers who believed firmly that the way to avoid future conflict was through promoting dialogue and expression between people who might not agree, but who needed a space in which to talk to each other and work out their differences. And that's really the core of everything that we do. We believe believe that freedom of expression is the right that allows you to fight for all of your other rights, and we believe that free expression and literature are indivisible. You need one to have the other, and literature is one of the great ways to promote freedom of expression. Another thing that I think people can do is um, consider hosting public events or writing in if you've got a hometown newspaper and you want to write in an op-ed or a letter to the editor about his case or about other free expression issues that matter to you. I think people forget that that still matters. People still pay attention to that news. Americans should care about this because a threat to free expression anywhere in the world is a threat to it everywhere. Free speech is a valuable and very delicate right, and it comes under threat every day in parts of the world, including in the United States. And as a country that has traditionally been a champion of free expression around the world and a great defender of it, you know, we, one of the things I admire personally about my country is that we really are absolute in this conviction that speech is always the way forward, that there is no speech that should be banned, that speech is, should always be encouraged, and that speech you don't agree with, the answer to that is more speech, is more dialogue. And as a country that has that particular history and inheritance of real respect and celebration of free speech, Americans should be involved in making sure that other people enjoy that right as well. Free speech is not a luxury, it's a right, and Americans have a role to play in sending that message abroad.